in the statistic that, you know, a brand message has 500%, over 500% greater reach when shared by employees compared to a brand. At the end of the day, influencing is advocacy and advocacy is influencing. It's all kind of the same in my mind. Um, you're getting a brand's message out there with a personal anecdote, with a personal opinion, a personal recommendation. Um, so I think there's definitely a huge miss with some of these B2C brands that are are more timid towards advocacy. Hi, and welcome to the Social at Scale podcast. I'm Cameron Brain, your host and the CEO and co-founder of Everyone Social. This podcast is dedicated to the topic of employee advocacy and how marketing, sales, and recruiting teams use it to drive efficient ROI. Let's get going. I'm Sabrina Baraksai. I'm the Senior Social Media Manager at Okta. So I lead the team across all social functions from community management, video creation, content creation, copywriting, to employee advocacy. I'm Lyndon Finlater. I'm Okta's Social Media Senior Specialist. Um, I work daily with Sabrina. I handle a lot of our day-to-day -day content that goes on our social media pages. I do a lot of writing and rewriting of posts, um, putting posts together with imagery, wh whether it's a, a one-off post or if it's part of a larger campaign. Um, I help out with promoting in-person and online events on social. Um, I'm also very involved in our short form video content um, from ideation to filming, especially for TikTok and just figuring out the best ways to use our social platforms uh, to achieve our marketing goals. So both of you have uh, a long kind of history professionally in, in social media. Um, why, why advocacy? Why is advocacy important to you, important to Okta? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Having come from, you know, brands of all sizes prior to Okta, I was at HBO and prior to HBO, I was at Apple. And then before that, I was at Salesforce for a while. So working in all of these different brands and social, I've really seen um, how much power employee advocacy brings to these brands and to these companies, um, whether it was at Salesforce working for B2B tech. Um the power of employee advocacy is so strong. Having these people, having your employees come and being really, you know, in tune with what the company is putting out was such an important metric for us. Um, and it's just a really great way to get the message out. At the end of the day, you are telling a story on social media. So having your employees help you tell that story is so powerful um, on the advocacy side. And I've seen it be very successful across um, all the different brands I've worked for. Yeah, definitely. And I think ultimately, when you go on social media, many people are wanting to hear from people. Um, I think now more than ever, people understand that there is a human, there is a social media manager behind the brand. But when you hear directly from employees, it makes just a huge difference. Um, and they really act as an extension of our social media team and our strategy. Um, so bringing in your employees is, is a really strong way to break down kind of the wall between brand and our audience. For sure. Um, either of you, Sabrina, you mentioned, uh, you know, seeing advocacy in action at some of these other, uh, brands that, that you've worked at, um, what were things that you saw that worked or, you know, by the time you got to, Octa, uh, what things did you want to improve upon? Yeah. Some things that I saw worked was when employees really took the time to kind of curate and ferret out content that they felt resonated with their followers. So for example, in a previous role, um, an employee that really resonated with the de developer content because they used to be a developer, but now they were in a marketing operations function. So constantly promoting content curated around developers and kind of really finding your niche, I found was really successful with um, employees who were using these advocacy programs. Cool. Lyndon, anything from your side on that? You know, uh, working at Okta is my first experience uh, with understanding employee advocacy. Um, so when I first started, I started learning all about Everyone Social. We were just onboarding the tool with everyone. Um, 
And I had never dealt with anything like that before. I'd never heard of anything like it before. Um, but really seeing how beneficial it's been for our company and for our employees and getting our, our messages out. It's, I can't believe I didn't know what that was before. Um, so it's been just such a huge benefit for us. Yeah, it's a funny thing. I mean, we've been, as you may know, we've been doing this a while. This is actually our, our 10th year uh, uh, with Everyone Social since launching our, our first customers. And um, it's, uh, we, we work with, you know, the same teams uh, kind of all along the way. You know, there's, there's, there's always folks like you at, at every company that, that we work with. And yet advocacy still seems to be this it's increased in terms of people's awareness of it, but um, uh, that uh, uh, I think you're not alone in that department, Lyndon, as far as like, there's still lots of folks out there where it's maybe just kind of a concept, but you know, they're not aware that there's actual tools around that and kind of other companies that have kind of institutionalized programs and things. Um, so with the, with the Octa program, um, how do you think about kind of, of all the things that you're doing with the advocacy program, content um, uh, and uh, you know what you're kind of directing people to do, how do you balance kind of the need for them to be doing things that are kind of centered on themselves, that are that are personal, personal branding, you know, versus uh, employer branding content that's more directly Octa focused? Do you, do you have any sort of, um, uh, I guess? you know, framework yourself in terms of what you want to see users doing? Yeah, I think, you know, authenticity is an overused word, but I really do think it applies here in this situation. Um, making sure content on your personal side is just speaking to your audience and speaking to your followers and your folks that are on, you know, your LinkedIn or your Twitter um, but coupling that with, you know, what you are seeing from the brands and how you can amplify that on your personal um, social channels. Um, for example, I really love a lot of the initiatives we have around diversity, inclusion, and belonging. That's an, a cause that's very close to me and something that Okta champions frequently. So we recently had a blog post about the Transgender uh, Day of Visibility on March 31st. So reposting that from everyone's social to my personal was super important to me. Um, and while I'll always like and heart some of the other maybe posts around a product focus or kind of innovations there, um, I know that it's maybe not going to connect as much on my personal feeds um, as it would on another employee's. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And, you know, what the beauty of everyone's social is you can put all of our content on there. Everyone can suggest content to go on there. So there's going to be something for everyone. Um, and, you know, kind of giving people that starting off point. Here's something really interesting you might like to put on your page. Here's some suggested copy, you know, if you don't know where to start, but really allowing people to edit that, delete things, add things, make it theirs in their voice. Um, you know, employees aren't going to be excited to put something out that doesn't sound like them. So really allowing that flexibility is important. One, uh, uh, how is the, I guess kind of a two-part question, um, how important is the culture at a company, you think, in supporting an advocacy program and, and, and associated with that, um, how how is executive use of social at, at at Okta? You know, is what what sort of relationship do you see between kind of the executive level and you know your efforts with the advocacy program? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think Okta's culture is one that lends itself really well to employee advocacy through everyone social. And what I mean by that is, you know, this company is on the smaller side from companies I've worked at, but I know for a lot of folks, it's the biggest company they've ever worked at. But really what Okta champions as a culture is collaboration. And, you know, there's no title in which you're too big to do something that another company might deem a simple task or a menial task. Like we all really just focus on getting work done and collaborating and supporting one another. And I think that spirit of collaboration and really lends itself to supporting the brand and supporting the company and the company's mission. Um, and that really kind of comes through on everyone's social. We have a lot of very passionate 
um, employees on everyone's social who are really championing all of our content and a lot of our posts that speak to them. So I think there is that, you know, tie-in of a company's culture to how they are using everyone's social. Um, for example, if a company is maybe very siloed or does not champion collaboration or people are very um, maybe protective of their projects or their resources, I could see maybe everyone's social um, or them not really having the right tool and culture to build a platform on everyone's social, whereas Okta does. Um, and on the executive side, Okta's executives really do support social media. They absolutely see the power of it, which is incredible. Um, sometimes a lot of social teams struggle with that, of getting executives uh, to have buy-in or to really see and understand why social media is important. Um, but with Okta going through this um, brand evolution last year, we really have so much opportunity ahead of us to use the megaphone of everyone social to really champion Okta and how we are the world's greatest identity platform and um, really pushing our message out there through our incredible employees. Yeah, exactly. You covered it, but you know, there's definitely a culture of being supportive. Um, everyone's very transparent about what everyone is working on. So, you know, even our leadership team knows what even kind of the smaller teams are doing. So they're very supportive. They're very clued in. Um, and so in turn, that makes them excited to share uh, certain things to their social profiles. What are you, uh, you know, again, both of you having been at various different companies, but, you know, social media being a common thread, um, uh, professionally over the years for you. What, what changes have you noticed in terms of executive use of social and and what do you think is driving that change? I, I think not to kind of uh, lead the witness, but like, you know, if we go back like five plus years, I feel like there were a lot more senior level executives who uh, really just kind of didn't do it at all and kind of disregarded its value. Um, and, you know, now social is something that I think everyone sees as being relevant, you know, to all sorts of areas of the business. I think we see more executives using it. Um, would just love to hear kind of what you think is, is driving that change. Something that I've been thinking a lot about is the state of social media pre-pandemic and the state of social media now. Um, you know, even just three, four years ago, it was a completely, there's so many things that were completely different. Um, and I think now, you know, people on social media are looking for less kind of polished, perfect content. They're looking to see behind the curtain. They want to see behind the scenes. Um, that's kind of where leadership and executives can get more involved where they hadn't before. Nobody knew about them or didn't want to see them or they didn't have a place in certain content. Whereas now, you know, the social media manager can make a TikTok with the CEO or the CTO and they're totally available and there's a face to the name. Um, so a lot of social media audiences are looking for that kind of experience now where they weren't before. So for you and your teams, uh, obviously you're doing a whole bunch of stuff you know, where does advocacy kind of rank in terms of your investments, your priorities? I know, like, we're in a very different world than we were a year ago. You know, the, I think the general theme with everyone we meet with seems to be some flavor of everyone's having to do more with less, um, all sorts of other changes, right? Marketing is oftentimes one of the groups that kind of feels those changes quickest, I think, you know, when the economy goes one, one direction or another. So, um, how do you how do you think about advocacy, you know, amongst all of your priorities and investments this year? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we have really looked at everyone's social as a another social media platform, one that's just as important as LinkedIn, where we have the most followers. It's just as important as Twitter. It's just as important as Instagram and TikTok for us. So up leveling it to that status and kind of just using our social media manager brains of like, okay, we're put, we need to post that on Twitter and LinkedIn. Oh yeah. And everyone's social as well. So just kind of bringing it there and kind of using our brains in that way um, of using it as a very important separate platform is, is very important to us. 
We've definitely um, reinvested and doubled down on everyone's social recently. We've kind of reallocated resources on the team to really bring it to the next level at our company. So, you know, looking at starting the leaderboard up, looking at what other teams within the company can we start training, um, you know, having other folks throughout the company reach out to myself directly and say, hey, I'm in sales, I'm in Houston, I love everyone's social, but how can I get my team um, who's also on sales can to, you know, start using the product. And I'm like, let's do like a special, special training or something. Let's like, you know, look at ways that we can start evangelizing the usage of everyone's social through all these different groups without the, throughout the company. So it's definitely growing and becoming a bigger part of our social media strategy in general at Okta. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we've all seen the statistic that, you know, a brand message has 500%, over 500% greater reach when shared by employees compared to a brand's, a brand's page. So that's an incredible improvement um, and just shows how much better off your brand presence is on social when you enable your employees to participate with you. And I think, you know, just thinking about that alone, like really puts it into perspective how important employee advocacy can be when you really prioritize it and put energy into it. Yeah. I mean, I know as, as both of you know, the, the kind of open secret is that all of these platforms um, prioritize content posted from users over content posted from brands or sponsors or publishers or, you know, and, and uh, uh, <laughs> it, it's hard not to feel bad for, you know, the brands and the publishers because over time it's just gotten kind of harder and harder for them. Right. You need to supplement that with, with ads to kind of boost, boost those posts and so forth to reach more people. But um yeah, it's, uh, you know, em employees kind of have that VIP access lane, right, in terms of how their content's treated, uh, in particular by the algorithm. Um, what, right now, like, as you look forward, what are the biggest challenges you see in front of you for this year? It, it could be related to advocacy, could be just related to, you know, your overall team goals. Um, you know, what, what what are you seeing for 2023? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, for 2023 in general, the challenges in social media are with the platforms. I think um, we've seen a lot of change at Twitter. Um, and so kind of seeing what, where that, you know, what that does for brands on Twitter. Um, so far, I think things have been a little more on the neutral side, at least for a brand like ours, and then also brands, uh, platforms like TikTok, kind of keeping up on what's going on with those platforms. So I think a lot of the challenges are, for me, um, anticipating what those platforms are going to change or how they're going to change, if they're going to change at all. Um, that's kind of something that I anticipate as a challenge this year. Um, and kind of what you already said, doing more with less. Um, we have a very lean and small social team at Okta um, compared to some other brands that I've been with previously. So um, yeah, just doing more with less and really trying to um, lean on platforms like Everyone Social to help us get the message out on social about our company and our product. Yeah. And for me, you know, I've been uh, seeing a lot and reading a lot about, you know, what is social media going to look like in the near future? And I see a lot of kind of blanket advice statements of, like I mentioned before, kind of breaking that fourth wall, more relatable content, personality driven content. So there's a challenge because, you know, think about that through the lens of the industry that you're in. And, you know, what Scrub Daddy is doing on TikTok, what Duolingo is doing is not going to work for every company. Right. So a challenge that I have is kind of seeing what's trending right now, what, what people are doing, what type of videos people are making. Um, and how do we kind of translate that and use that for a tech company, for our industry? Um, how can we create entertaining content when maybe the content itself isn't something that everyone understands right away? Um, most people aren't going to stop scrolling if a post is full of super complex terms, um, which it can be really easy to kind of fall back into that um, with in a tech company. Um, so, you know, it'll be an, an interesting challenge and something that I'm learning a lot about of how to create entertaining and engaging content. But that's 
informative and not distracting based on the content that we're promoting, um, especially when it comes to TikTok and, and platforms like that that are inherently very casual. Cutting through the noise and grabbing people's attention. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we benefit from um, are these conversations, right? And every other conversation we have with, uh, with our customers and, and, you know, with prospects, I, you know, not, not all advocacy programs are kind of focused on pure marketing and sales, you know, objectives. We still have clients that are, uh, and sometimes it's a combination of things. It could be employer branding, right. Kind of more, more recruiting focused and so forth. But um, I mean, I've already learned things through our conversation, just kind of even little things that kind of like, oh, you're talking about something that I've heard, you know, two other people talk about this week. And um, so that's, you know, for, for us, definitely kind of going to the source is really our, our primary kind of point of inspiration for, you know, a lot of our content and trying to, trying to anticipate what's going to stick and, you know, what's going to resonate. Um and even though Okta is a highly technical product, it's a it's a great product. Like we're we're a customer, and uh, it actually uh, you know reduces I think all of our uh, frustration with logging in, uh, which is like an increasingly you know giant pain these days. Um, your goals for advocacy this year? Um, uh, any any particular metrics or things that uh, you want to do that you didn't do last year? Yes, um, definitely focusing on growth um, for advocacy. So really uh, user growth specifically. So wanting to get every employee on there um, to be using the tool and seeing how you know easy of a lift it is on their end to go in like once a week or once every other week and just jump in and share something um, to social. Um, obviously we prefer employees to jump in and do it every day. But um, once a week or once every other week, twice a month, I think is a huge um, growth goal for us. But, you know, zooming out, definitely want to focus on getting as many employees on the tool as possible. Yeah. And really enabling them from day one as well, kind of having everyone social be a part of their onboarding package, understanding and, and getting them onto the tool and learning about it um, just as they're learning about everything else at the company. Um, so yeah, we want to show that it's, it's super easy and super beneficial to be involved. Nice. Yeah. Getting people right when they're coming in is that's, we've seen that be so successful, uh, at clients, you know, in addition, of course, to all the people that are already there and trying to figure out how to kind of, you know, get to them and in an appropriate way, in a way that works for them. Um, we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming in the next few months. Uh, we've got a, Big release. We'll be sharing some more, you know, information on with with your team that includes some things around new employee activation. I think you know, th there's no way to get around it, right? Like the more people you have active, uh, mm -hmm. and the easier the tools you're giving them, the more they're going to share, the more results are going to generate, right? So um, that's kind of always on the top of our mind. Is how can we make things as simple as possible, and you know, set you all up to be able to kind of activate people, but in a way that's, you know, appropriate for their kind of habits and, and, uh, you know, aptitude, because not everyone's obviously the same, you know, some are more sophisticated in their use of social versus others. But uh, um, what do you think, you know, I, uh, Sabrina, one, one question I have for you is, um, having been at now a B2B organization, and, you know, previously been at some B2C companies, what sort of differences do you see between, you know, social in general in terms of how they think about it and, and perhaps also advocacy? Um, kind of oddly, we've seen B2B really be kind of the primary, um, uh, kind of the, the primary industry. So if you want, if we want to think of B2B as an industry, like type of company that's attracted to advocacy, B2C, we've seen a little bit more timid. We've had some amazing clients over the years that have been really kind of like visionary, uh, but a lot more B2B. And uh, Lyndon would love to hear your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think when it comes to B2C and B2B, the approaches are, they're like the same, but different. Um, when it comes to something at, like advocacy, I have seen with B2C brands that there isn't that same resting on the brand in general and kind of resting on 
what culture at large is talking about. So for example, having worked in entertainment, um, you know, people are going to be talking about the latest TV show that everyone's watching, maybe less so about identity access management. So you just kind of have that hunger built in with B2B that you really want to rely on your employees to kind of get the message out to the right people and um, to amplify, whereas B2C doesn't really have that same drive, um, which I think is a bit of a miss. Um, I think with totally these, yeah, B2C brands, I think there's so much, um, there's so many incredible, you know, insights that an employee could add about something that a B2C brand is working on, um, you know, thinking about maybe like a skincare brand, like, hey, I have maybe a different skin tone than most people, but this sunscreen worked really well on me. And I think like this is something I want to share and it's a company I work for. So even those like personal like anecdotes or personal um, messaging for certain types of content from a B2C brand, I think is super powerful. Um, and I think, again, like I, I, I see why a B2C brand is maybe not investing in an advocacy tool, but I think it it's kind of a miss for sure. Um, there's definitely a lot of room to build out um, kind of these employee advocacy programs. And I think a B2C brand would maybe look at it as like turning their employees into influencers or like micro influencers. But at the end of the day, influencing is advocacy and advocacy is influencing. It's all kind of the same in my mind. Um, you're getting a brand's message out there with a personal anecdote, with a personal opinion, a personal recommendation. Um, so I think there's definitely a huge miss with some of these B2C brands that are are more timid towards advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, it's, it's people to people. We're all people talking to each other. Right. Um, it's all about kind of the intention is kind of what switches. It's like, are you talking to somebody with the intention of hoping that they purchase something or with the intention of just brand awareness? Um, so, you know, in that sense, employee advocacy is so beneficial for B2B and B2C, you know, like I said, people to people. Yeah, I appreciate both your thoughts on that. I think it's, um, Sabrina, what you said about kind of them having enough to kind of keep going, right? There's, there's, there's kind of the, the, uh, um, there's that, you know, I think you described it as like built, built in hunger, built in incentive, whatever, you know, for kind of the relevance of, of what they can talk about at a brand level. But, you know, the, the funny thing is it just kind of seeing this over the years, it's like, there's so much brand affinity, right, at an individual level with so many of these consumer groups, uh, consumer companies, right? I mean, the employees are the customers, to your point, like, you know, B2B, none of us are the individual customer of, you know, Okta or everyone social, we may be a user, but um, yeah, we're, we're, we're seeing some more interest uh, uh, in, in the realm of, of B2C. We have some clients that kind of operate in in both worlds, you know, they have a B2B function and then they have kind of a direct to consumer function as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I think that's something that we, uh, we would really like to see, uh, kind of change over the next year or so is just more B2C brands kind of, you know, getting on the train. Cause I, I I'm a hundred percent in agreement with you. I think it's, I think it's a huge miss on their part. Um, maybe just to wrap up our, our conversation, um, uh, what do you see as kind of being the the major trends this year, or you know, perhaps said differently, like who are who's going to be successful and and why are they going to be successful? You know, in the realm of of social, and we can stick to B two B. Obviously, that's the context of of, of Okta. But um, what's what's your view for this year? My view for this year, and I guess the near future. Um, kind of going off a little bit about what I touched upon, you know, and kind of like how social media is so different now than it was just three years ago. Things are moving and changing quickly and you have to be kind of on your toes to move and change along with it or to predict what might be coming next. Um, you know, people who are still kind of adhering to a social strategy that worked really well in 2018 and 2019, they're going to fall behind in a lot of ways, unfortunately. So you have to kind of be on your toes, be reevaluating your content. If you post something that doesn't do well, why didn't it do well? 
would it have done well five years ago, 10 years ago, and it's not doing well now, that tells you a lot of information about, you, you know, the kind of direction that you need to be going. Um, so somebody who's going to be really successful this year is someone who's constantly reevaluating and constantly staying up to date with what's going on. Things are just moving so quickly. Absolutely. And to add on to that, I think um, something that we have been seeing over the years in general is um, social media platforms are really pushing individuals and kind of these micro influencers or um, the individual posts and creators on social media. So I definitely see that continuing to grow and brands leveraging platforms like Everyone Social or leveraging micro creators, influencers on all the platforms, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, um, TikTok, especially. I think that's going to continue to grow and grow. And you're really going to see the rise of a lot of creators who have a niche and are talking about, you know, identity access management or, you know, sunscreen or their favorite water bottles for intense hikes. You're really going to see the rise of that. And I think um, brands who are want to stay ahead of the curve are going to be, well, hopefully they're already doing it, but if not, they're going to start kind of building out advocacy influencer programs, um, using tools like everyone social or other platforms or other tools. I think really that's going to be a continued trend. We're going to see, um, in addition to everything Lyndon mentioned, you know, you really have to stay on top of everything and, and really be, have a very keen eye for all the trends that are popping up, um, across social every day. Yeah, it's hard to imagine someone using a 2018 or 2019 strategy. It's like that's like a century ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, much has changed. Like, yeah. But yeah, I mean, as you both said, it's like it's even if you're even if you're living in the year 2023, it's still hard to keep up with, you know, everything that's going on. But um, I appreciate both of you making time for this so much. This is a, a I really enjoyed our conversation and and your thoughts and um yeah, let's let's do it again at some point. Yeah, would love that. Thanks so much for reaching out. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Social at Scale podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please be sure to subscribe. If you didn't enjoy it, please let me know. You can access past episodes on our site at everyonesocial.com slash podcast. As always, please feel free to connect with me directly on Twitter or LinkedIn and look forward to seeing you next time.